Well, the Discover Hailing project has certainly unearthed some interesting memories of World War II. From the Home Guard, to the air raid wardens, from the military occupation to the land army, we found a host of tales to tell you. Now, there are still plenty of World War II relics, like this pillbox here, scattered all over Hailing for us to discover. And we're very fortunate to still have amongst us some islanders who can tell us their personal stories of those troubled times. Times when these strange objects played a very important role in our everyday lives. Watson was a gunner at the ACAC site during World War II and she had a very lively time indeed. Apparently, Londoner Dot got so mad during the Blitz that she promptly went and volunteered for the ATS, despite being only 17 at the time. I was mad in London when these gunners come over and are shooting us down. So before we moved up to it, I, I went and I joined the army, but I didn't tell my mum <laughs> and, and, um, because she would have stopped me. Right. She would have preferred me to go and do ammunition and things like that, but I didn't want, I wanted to get there and be there. And I went and I volunteered and they said, how old are you? And I said I was 18, but I wasn't, I was only 17. And. Um, and then they said, yeah, OK, you're here. And the next minute, there I was. And my mum was so cross. She went up there and she tried to stop them from having me. And um, too late, I was there. To me, it was having your own back. And oh, I had my own back. And I got made a corporal. It, it was like heaven. I, I was with people that I hadn't met from. Been a, I was a right cockney Londoner. But they all took me and it was so wonderful being with people. So away from your family? And a, a, well, actually, in a way, it was freedom. You know, because my mum used to want me in at nine o'clock, five o'clock and all. But mind you, we did work. I'm getting old now, but I can still remember the gunners, and I've got photos of them, and I say, oh yes, and it takes back wonderful memories, mm -hmm. and the fact that we did, we got three, the <laughs> other half said they got, but they didn't, it was us, and, and I was proud, I was proud of being English and doing something. In one way, it was one of the happiest times of my life down on Sina Warren. Dot was billeted here at Sina House, and although she enjoyed her stay, it was probably quite a bit different to today's holiday experiences. Noel Pycroft's family were the last brickmakers to operate on Hailing, finally closing down in 1989. Clearly, Noel had an exciting time as a boy on wartime Hailing. Life was all one big adventure for a young lad, and he has lots of tales to tell us of those eventful times. Uh, the first, one of my first memories of the Second World War was, of course, the building of the gun sites, and we were quite close to them and they had to bring the guns across the bridge and they didn't pull them with a lorry because they got heavy so they winched them across on they were on a trolley and they winched them across. The big ones then said hailing as far as I can remember were taken down to said hailing by rail where they had a ramp but they could run them off and then installed them in huge concrete bunkers which are still there, of course. The bridge itself was bombed, or attempted to be bombed, and there were two craters in between the railway bridge and the road bridge, but, and three others 
one in the mud uh, opposite the Royal Oak and two round on the shore at Warbrington. That was when the, they attempted. And I think that was about 10 o'clock at night when the Home Guard were guarding the bridge and my father was on duty and the bomb went off. Um, we were in our air raid shelter and uh, there was an air raid going on and about nine o'clock in the evening we heard a, a, a rush and a bump and that said there's an aeroplane down, it's not a bomb, there's an aeroplane down here and then the girls in Dunslogan uh, started screaming and Dad said, that aircraft has come down and said, their house. Dad, had he not done it, the pole wouldn't have lived. Because he went outside the air raid shelter and could hear somebody calling. And that would be about a quarter of a mile away. And he was saying, come quick, come quick. He couldn't say help. He couldn't speak English hardly. And it come quick. So... We went down, dad, my dad could isolate where the sound came from, and it was on Werner Common, as I say, about a quarter of a mile away. We went down then on the shore, the tide was out, and my mother came. She said, we're pretty well sure where he is. If you run round the top of the creek, you boys, and take a torch and shine it and shout if he's bleeding, because he was hurt, you know. So we went and run round the creek and found Jan covered with his parachute and he had a little torch and he was shining on his PAF identity card uh, with um, no one boot off and, and, boot, and a broken leg. He said that he hurt his leg falling out of the aircraft, broke it, the hurricane aircraft. And um, the Marines came from St John Hall, they came and um, carted him off to um, the air raid warden's house, Rose Cannell and Gops Lane, Captain Morgan, and they carted him off there. He uh, was taken to Haven Hospital, and uh, his wife, uh, he has a wife here, and she stayed with the vicar of Bedhampton while he was in hospital. Marshall was born in 1918 to a family with many business interests and properties on Hailing, particularly at Beachlands. Her mother's family took over the old saltwater bathhouse and operated those wonderful bathing machines favoured by our more modest forebears. I gather you were even provided with a hot water foot bath for when you got out of the water. When war came, she applied to work for Neville Shute Norway's Airspeed Aircraft Factory in Portsmouth, working on the design of the Horsa gliders used in the airborne invasion of Normandy. My grandparents came to Hailing around about 1900, I don't know the exact date. They were Alfred and Rebecca Green, and the first shop they took over when they came to Hailing was what is now still Claps. When the, what we call the old bathhouse became available, they took that over. They were still doing hot seawater baths, which I thought was interesting because that was why they, that bathhouse was set up originally. When the grand plan of hailing was, was built up, that was to be where everybody could go to have their hot seawater baths. There was a pump out in the sand and the seawater was pumped up into a copper in the old bathhouse where it was heated up and then they could come from the Royal Hotel and have their hot seawater baths in comfort. No going into the cold sea for them. I was one of the first girls who was allowed to work in a drawing office at what was then Airspeeds, where Anchorage Park now is port in Portsmouth. Yes. And that was where the Horsa Glider, which was such a, such a success on D-Day, where the Horsa Glider was designed and built. On D-Day, when they attacked the bridge at Caen, they would have been, and they were, 
a complete surprise to the people guarding the bridge because they came so silently and so quickly that they, they just didn't react. And that, of course, was one of the complete successes of the war, the taking of that bridge by the, by the um, airborne troops, because from there came all the success afterwards, because it opened up the way into France from the, the beach landings. Of course, at the start of the war, Haining changed completely because all the holiday camps were taken over for troops. There was a, an anti-aircraft station at North Haining. There was another one, a permanent one, at Sina, the site of which can still be seen by the golf course there. And hailing was, it wasn't exactly a no-go area, but it was, it was restricted, seriously restricted, not only hailing, but the whole of the south coast, because so much was going on here, which was leading towards the reinvasion of, of uh, Europe. And at that date, 1940, they were already planning how they could get back into Europe when the day came. When I was coming home from airspeed on my bicycle, after the Dieppe parade, the Germans were following the, the boats all the way back into Portsmouth. And I can remember I got as far as Farlington and decided the machine guns were coming a bit close and I got off my bicycle and lay in the ditch for 10 minutes before they'd gone on so that I could just go on cycling home. Another islander with a lovely tale to tell is Phil Rowe. Born and raised on Hailing, Phil worked throughout the war as a land girl alongside her sister Peg at Manor Farm. When women were called up, they had the option of joining the land army and Phil decided to join alongside her sister, although she was actually too young and she had to wait another year before she could wear that distinctive uniform. She tells us they worked from 8 in the morning until 8 at night through the summer months, all for 10 pence an hour. That's 5p in our money. She met Gordon, her husband-to-be, at a dance at the Coronation Holiday Camp. We now know it as Lakeside. This had been requisitioned for the armed forces and they held regular dances there for the servicemen and the locals. Gordon served in the Navy as a crewman on an infantry landing craft, preparing to transport troops from this area to the Normandy beaches in 1944. When D-Day arrived, his flotilla set out for France with no prior warning whatsoever. And like so many women left behind, Phil just had to get on with her life and her own war work on Manor Farm. And she wasn't to hear from him again. Until one day a miracle happened, literally from out of the blue and totally without warning, a familiar figure appeared at the other side of the field. It was Gordon who'd sailed his landing craft back from the Normandy beaches to Langston and then immediately walked the four miles to South Hailing. He'd called at her home in Seagrove Avenue and was told she was still at work and then he tramped a further mile and a half back to Mill Rive. But what a reunion! Now is that a romantic story or is it? Gordon survived several further missions in the Mediterranean war zone and they were reunited and married in St Mary's Church in January 1945 and naturally they lived happily ever after as they do in all the best romantic tales. Heroes are generally unassuming and often multi-skilled, but few of us would expect church organist, chorister, keen allotment holder and cyclist Jim Booth to have had such a colourful wartime record. When he came
came back to his old haunt here at Hailing Island Sailing Club last spring, Jim told me about his mission to the Gold Beach landing site in 1944, crewing an X-craft midget submarine. Apparently, that mission went so well that on their return, the X-craft crews were promptly posted to the Far East. We were extremely fortunate to obtain this BBC footage of a D-Day piece by the late Jill Dando, which says so much about the courageous exploits of the extraordinary men of combined operations pilotage parties. Submarines were underwater, under hand, and damned un-English. No occupation for a gentleman. Such was the view of submariners in the early part of this century. It was thought sneaky, creeping around beneath the water, out of view of conventional craft. The Jolly Roger, flown by submariners, gives us some idea, though, of the pride they had in their role and that reputation. On the evening of Friday, the 2nd of June, 1944, two ex-craft like this one set out to uphold the very best of submarining traditions. Their job was to creep undetected to the Normandy coast, and they were then to sit on the bottom until dawn on D-Day. Their job then was to run up lights on masts to guide the Allied fleet in. George Honor was a lieutenant commanding one of the subs at the time. George, what were conditions like being underwater for so long? Well, by the time D-Day came, we'd been submerged for nearly four days and it was getting very murky and the oxygen supply could have been running out as we had no knowledge of how long our supply would last. Um, we were a little bit worried too because when we set off on the operation, we were called Operation Gambit and we looked this up in the local library and we found it was the, the move you throw away before a big move in chess, which didn't exactly excite us. So, Jim, what was your role in the operation? Well, I was in an organisation called COP, Combined Operations Pilage and Reconnaissance Party, and my team's job embarked in the X-23 was to arrive off the Sword Beach, in fact, 48 hours before, uh, fix our position extremely accurately, which we had to do, and then uh, produce a marker lamp, which could be shone to seaward at the actual time of the invasion so the leading craft would then see the line to come in on and they wouldn't go farther to the east which would have been extremely dangerous for them. So when did you hear that D-Day itself was actually going to go ahead? We heard um, by wireless transmission on Monday night during the hours of darkness. We only surfaced for a very short time, stuck our aerial up, got the message and went down again and waited a further 24 hours. And what were conditions like then? The weather was still terribly bad. Way to break over the craft, we had to pump out all the time, and we were very surprised that the invasion was then on, but very relieved as our oxygen may well have been running out. Is what were conditions like inside for five men? Well, we were right as long as the oxygen supply kept up. Of course, it was murky, damp, and otherwise very horrible, and there was a feeling of uh, rather like a couple of stiff gins. for yourself, you see how cramped conditions must have been for five men in here all together. This is the control room. If they wanted to grab a couple of hours sleep, then they could go there. That's the battery room back there. I don't remember ever feeling it, it, it was doing this, but then that is what happens in, the, in, in war. I think servicemen never believe that anything could happen to them. That's Jim Booth on the bows of X-23 on D-Day. At the ferry, we still have this remnant of the floating Mulberry Harbour used on D-Day. And like these remains on the beach at Arromanche, it would certainly bring back memories to one particular hero of the Normandy landings. Major Logan Scott Bowden trained here at Hailing Island Sailing Club as a member of a secret combined operations unit, code-named COPS, or Combined Operations Pilotage Parties. 
This group of courageous young men trained under Commander Nigel Wilmot for clandestine reconnaissance work on invasion beaches throughout the world. And in just three years, they were awarded 90 medals and commendations for their bravery. We visited General Scott Bowden to hear all about his daring exploits as a young officer on the coast of Normandy six months prior to the invasion in 1944, when this particular specimen was a priceless sample taken from the intended invasion beaches. Well, General, thank you for agreeing to meet us today. I'm really privileged to hear about your exploits on hailing in World War II. Well, I, I served in special forces in the Norwegian campaign for that reason and Nigel was particularly uh, pleased to accept me as his um, a senior soldier and member of the number one reconnaissance team. So General can you just talk us through the purpose of your mission to Gold Beach please? Uh, we were sent over on New Year's Eve to examine an isolated metre square block of peat uh, which was there on the beach and the probability was that if there was peat there would be clay fairly near the surface which would be highly dangerous to an invasion force uh, and so we made our way back knowing it would be fairly safe, safe because the Germans were having a, a, a New Year's Eve party and they were an hour ahead in time on us and they, we could hear they were very well on and we didn't think we'd have any trouble from them. And so we carried out our examination and then uh, uh, set about getting out through the breakers because the uh, wind had risen to force five and uh, we had some difficulty in getting out and we did eventually break through and uh, Bruce Ogden Smith started yelling and uh, he was slightly behind me and I uh, swam back to him and he was shouting Happy New Year and I said swim me be, or we'll be back on the beach. And then I relented and wished him a happy new year too. And then we swam out <coughs> and and shone our directional torches uh, towards where we hoped our recovery boat would be. And it seemed a little while before it fetched up, but suddenly it was there. And we were hauled in first in a recovery boat and then we got to the motor torpedo boat which took us over and were hauled into that and then set off for home. Now I gather the Americans wanted you to do similar observations at Omaha Beach? Yes, uh, General Bradley who was Commander-in-Chief of all the American invasion forces um, having heard that we had examined the British beach uh, wanted Omaha Beach, as it came to be known, to be examined too. And by this time, our midget submarines had come down from Rock Stribbon uh, to the inner harbour at Fort Blockhouse. And then we went over in one of those, being towed out a, a third of the way by an arm puller and then we were on our own and went on overnight arriving just after dawn to find a French fishing fleet outside Omaha Beach with their nets out. Ken Hudsmith who was the Australian in command of our boat decided that we could get through underneath the net but there was a German soldier in the bow of the boat with his in a great coat on and collar turned up and smoking a Bavarian pipe <laughs> and we didn't want to be seen by him mm. but we we avoided that quite all right and uh, 
were then able to go ahead with our uh, main reconnaissance of Omaha Beach, which took us, uh, well, another uh, three, uh, three days. So how long did you have to spend in the midget submarine? Well, we spent the best part of five days. Can you tell us what the conditions were like inside there? Well, they were, well, they were very smelly, <laughs> to say the least, because we couldn't dispose of any gas. And, uh, and so when we came in to um, Gosport, uh, to the inner harbour, when we opened up, there was a slightly on blowing breeze and the reception committee took a very smart step backwards. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing to see the cumbersome wetsuits they wore then, to say nothing of the extraordinary amount of kit they needed to carry on their missions. This colourful scene would have been a whole lot different 66 years ago. There was no seaside railway then, nor fun fair, no donkey rides for the children, no splashing about in the sea. Hailing's beaches were alive with military vehicles, not seaside amusements. This was the location for Exercise Fabius II, a top secret rehearsal for the D-Day landings in Normandy. 10,000 men were landed from 250 landing craft and 12 ships in just a few hours. And extraordinary as it now seems, very few islanders were aware that it was going on. They say Winston Churchill watched the exercise from the roof of the Royal Hotel with General Eisenhower and King George took the salute as it all got underway. So Hailing Island had a central role in yet another part of the Allies war effort. Finally, it's wonderful to see the younger generation taking an active interest in our wartime history. So we were delighted to meet the Hailing Scouts and hear about their expedition to explore the Normandy beaches. Ed Harrison led the Hailing Scouts on their own mission to the Normandy beaches just a few months ago. So, Ed, tell us about that. Well, we organised it as our summer camp for a bit of fun, but actually the historical content was huge. And I just think it's really important for these guys to see firsthand what it was all about, rather than just reading it from a textbook. Mm -hmm. And how many did you take? We had 18 scouts and nine leaders. Lovely. And Nathan, tell me, what would you remember most about the trip? I remember the cemetery because there were so many people there that gave our lives to save Britain. Mm -hmm. And what sort of age group and numbers? 18 and 19. Very young. Yeah. Yes. 
And Dan, what did you enjoy most about it? I enjoyed going along the coast and seeing all the gun placements and the bunkers. Mm -hmm. And were you allowed to, to get involved in, in, in looking at it and so uh, You were allowed to go on most of the bunkers and climb inside and see the conditions that the Germans were in. Great. Well, guys, it's been lovely to have you with us here today. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, it's quite incredible that these contributors were so young when World War II broke out and we are so privileged to have these first-hand stories of our island's history and we'll continue to record many more as other islanders come forward with their reminiscences of Hailing's past.